Well, as usual, it's good to be back in the Lord's house this morning, isn't it? Be alive. It's ninety percent of the battle, right? Being alive. We're going to get back into the Word of God this morning. We're going to take a little uh, one-week break here out of Galatians, and uh, I got a little Mother's Day. Uh, <coughs> sermon for you so one more time i'll tell you happy mother's day to all the uh, moms and grandmothers and great grandmothers mothers to be we don't have any great great grandmothers in here do we mothers to be well in theory <laughs> someday <laughs> Well, I don't know, do we? Uh, well, Hunter and Morgan, are here, <coughs> but they're not here. Today, right? I don't know. Maybe it was prophetic. I was just getting excited. You're not expecting, are you? My name's not Sarah. Yes, it was. Remember, we had a deal. It was going to be you. But anyway, happy Mother's Day again. If it wasn't for mothers, right? I guarantee you, a hundred percent of us. Uh, would not be here. And if it was not for all the mothers behind the scenes in the Bible, none of the heroes of the faith, uh, you know, would be there either that left us with instructions for life. And they wouldn't have made it very far either uh, without good old mom. And uh, this morning we're going to take a look at a mother in the Bible. Uh, she doesn't get talked about a whole lot. And when she does, she usually gets a bad rap. We're usually kind of criticizing her. And uh, But since it's Mother's Day, I'm going to find some positive things to say about this uh, lady today. So if you got your Bibles with you this morning, uh, turn to Matthew chapter 20. For those of you under 50, you can swipe to Matthew chapter 20. Swipers? Yeah, you're not swiping anymore. No. She's over 50. She is. <laughs> and she's, she's over 50. But still having babies. So. <laughs> so you can still swipe. Uh, Matthew 20, verses 20 to 23. And it says... Then the mother of Zebedee's sons approached him with her sons, and she knelt down to ask him for something. She's asking Jesus here for something there. And Jesus says, well, what do you want? Promise, she said to him, that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right and the other on your left, in your kingdom. And Jesus answered, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup? that I am about to drink? We are able, they said to him. And he told them, you will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right and left is not mine to give. Instead, it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. Well, let's bow for a prayer. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this time. Uh, we can come to your house uh, this morning, Lord, to worship you in song and worship you in spirit. And uh, we want to thank you for all of our moms, all of our mothers, uh, that we wouldn't be here without them. We, we thank you for them and we pray that you bless them, our moms and grandmas uh, out here uh, today. And, well, all of our parents, and it's a tough job, one of the toughest, and we pray for them uh, that you take care of them for another year. I pray you send your Holy Spirit upon us uh, this morning, Lord, so that we can learn from uh, a mother from long ago. And in Jesus' name, I pray and give thanks. Amen. So someone once wrote that Mother's Day is traditionally the day, uh, you know, when children give something back to their mothers for all the spit they produce to wash dirty faces. You know, you ever get that one when you're a kid? I guess there's no water around when you got a dirty face. And then right there, it's always got that mom spit smell to it too, right? 
for all the old gum they held in their hands, right? Only a mom will take a kid's gum and kind of hold it in their, their hands. Uh, all the noses they wiped, all the bloody knees they made well with their kisses. And this is the day mothers are rewarded for, uh, you know, washing puke off those sheets in the middle of the night. Driving kids to school when they miss the bus or uh, sitting through all those football games and baseball games in the rain. And it's a day of appreciation for, you know, making your children finish something they said they couldn't do and uh, not believing them for a second when they get mad and pout and say, I hate you. You knew they never meant it, right? Sharing all their good times and their bad times. So what exactly are mothers? Well, mothers are teachers, mothers are disciplinarians, mothers are cleaning ladies, uh, some mothers are gardeners and landscapers, mothers are nurses and doctors and psychologists and counselors and chauffeurs and coaches, all wrapped up into one. They wear a lot of hats. Mothers are developers of personalities, molders of vocabularies, and shapers of attitudes. And mothers are soft voices saying, I love you. Mothers are linked to God, uh, being a child's first impression of God's love. Of course, mothers are all these things and much, much more. And this one time, you know, a man came home from work one afternoon. He Found his three small children, they were outside still in their pajamas and they were playing in the mud. And some of their toys were scattered across the yard and on the driveway and the door of his wife's car was wide open and so was the front door of the house. So surprised at this, he runs inside and he finds it to be a big mess. A lamp had been knocked over and the TV was on real loud. With the cartoons playing, the living room was littered with toys and kids' clothes were everywhere. And he goes into the kitchen and the sink was full of dirty dishes and there was cereal spilled all over the, the counter. The refrigerator door was wide open and there was dog food all over the floor. So now he's starting to get real worried, right? Fearing the worst and in a panic, he frantically begins looking for his wife and he goes down the hall and he's stepping over toys the whole way, more piles of clothes as he as he goes, and he's thinking, you know, at best she's sick, and at worst, maybe something even worse had happened. So rushing into their bedroom, he sees her, and she's still in her pajamas, and she's laying there curled up on their bed, reading a book. And she looks up and she smiles at him and she says, Well, how was your day today, honey? And completely you know, confused, he looked at her and said, well, what happened here today? And again, she smiled and answered, well, you know how every day when you come home and you always ask me, what in the world do you do all day long? And he says, yes. And then she says, well, today I didn't do it. <laughs> right, so maybe with all that in mind, we can better understand Mrs. Zebedee. Uh, the mother of James and John. Now, Mrs. Zebedee, you know, she was aware of the teachings of Jesus about his kingdom, and, you know, she was uh, also very aware of the fact that her two sons were, were very close to him, James and John, right? Those were her kids. And uh, she knew they were close to Jesus, and they were two-thirds of Jesus's uh, inner circle, right? There was Peter and James and, and John, and she was the mom of uh, two of them. So she was certain that when the Lord formed his kingdom that they would have uh, positions of responsibility and, and authority. Uh, but in the first part of this same chapter, uh, Jesus tells a, a story that might have got her a little bit worried. And it was a story about a landowner who went out to find laborers early in the morning. They agreed upon a fair day's wage, and so they started working. And then at uh, noon, he went out, he found some more workers, and they started working. And then towards the evening, only a couple hours in the day left, he went out and found some more, and they started working. Yet, when the landowner paid them all at the end of the day, they all got the same wage. Right? Y'all remember that story. So it must have caused Mrs. Zebedee to wonder 
Well, are my sons really going to have positions of authority in the Lord's new kingdom? Are they going to be high up on the totem pole? So when the opportunity presented itself, she comes to the Lord, and Matthew says that she kneeled down before him, and she makes this request. Promise me that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right and the other on your left, in your kingdom. Now, in any you know number of the other 51 Sundays during the year, you know, we might very well criticize Mrs. Zebedee for her, you know, lack of understanding or, you know, we'd say, well, she's just being selfish, right? Because we're all just so enlightened. But since today's Mother's Day, maybe we ought to think for a few moments concerning some positive things about Mrs. Zebedee and you know, we also need to recognize that when she came to Jesus, while Jesus did not flat out tell her yes, you know, he didn't tell her no either. He simply reminded her of the cost of being seated on the right or left and told her that it is the Father who determines who will be seated there. But the first positive thing I want you to notice about Mrs. Zebedee here, which is number one on your outlines, is she wanted her sons to be part of the kingdom. She wanted them to be a big part of the kingdom. Now, I can't think of any more important task of motherhood, or fatherhood, uh, for that matter, than to do everything that you can to make sure your children are part of the kingdom of God. And I know that uh, many mothers pray. Sometimes they pray out of necessity. Sometimes they pray because motherhood's not easy, but extremely difficult. And uh, James Dobson, most of you have heard of him, he tells a story about the time he came home uh, when his son Ryan was a small baby, and it had been a terrible day for his wife. And little Ryan had been sick, he cried all day, and uh, once as she was changing his diapers, the telephone rang, and uh, surely that's his wife. She reached over to answer it before fastening up his diaper. And just then, Ryan had another attack of diarrhea. She cleaned up that mess and put him in clean clothes. Then she took him into the living room and she fed him. And as she was burping him, he threw up all over himself and her and the couch too. And Dobson writes, when I came home, I could smell the aroma of motherhood everywhere. And Shirley cried out to him, was all of this in my contract? <laughs> right? Sometimes mothers just pray out of the frustration of it all. And, uh, you know, sometimes in the frustration of trying to teach our, you know, children, we realize the difficulties of communication with them. The father tells the story at the time he gave his two-year-old son, Steve, his very first responsibility. And he told Steve to watch Susan, his baby sister. And while he stepped out of the room, now mother wouldn't do that, leave the two-year-old in charge of the baby, but the father would. Well, he steps out of the room, he'd only been gone a few seconds when he hears a thump, right? Then he hears Susan start to cry. So he rushed back in there to find out that, that Susan had fallen off the couch and she was stretched out on the floor. And meanwhile, Steve just kind of sat there, you know, looking all innocent. And the father said, Steve, I told you to watch your little sister. And Steve says, I did. And Steve was right. You know, he watched her fall right off that couch and he sat there and watched her cry too. He did exactly what he was told to do. But being a parent's not easy, right? Sometimes you're filled with joy, sometimes with sadness, sometimes your, your children make you so proud you want to cry. And uh, other times they make you want to pull your hair out and cry. You know, some would understand the feelings of the, you know, mother with three children who was asked, if you had to do it all over again, would you have your children again? And she said, well, yes, just not the same ones. 
No, nah, none of you would say that, would you? You know, being a parent's not easy. It's difficult. It's like a marathon, not a sprint. But Mrs. Zebedee gives us a valuable example because she prayed earnestly that her sons would be part of his kingdom. And it just very well might be the most important prayer that a mother can ever make. And we need that same concern for our, you know, kids and grandkids. And, you know, what, what good is it if our kids are successful and making money and, you know, driving the best vehicles in the, you know, 5,000 <coughs> square foot houses if they don't know God? What does it matter if they gain the whole world and lose their souls? So I hope that in the heart of every mother and father, and grandmother and grandfather here this morning that there is a burden to go to the throne of God and to pray for your children and your grandchildren that they will be saved and part of the kingdom of God. That is the place to begin. Okay, and even though sometimes uh, we may give Mrs. Zebedee a hard time when we read this story in the Bible, uh, keep in mind that that's what she really wanted. Right? She just wanted her two boys to be a part of the kingdom. And then the second thing we can see here about Mrs. Zebedee, which is number two on your outlines, is she wanted her sons to work in the kingdom. And just be a part of it, to, but to work in it. And the Bible says, you know, it's not enough just to be saved. It's enough to get you into heaven. But that's where it begins, not ends. Okay, churches are full of people content to, you know, just fill a pew on Sunday mornings. The same pew. Right? The same cushion. Some of you have been sitting in the same pew for so long, your rear end print is right there in that cushion. It's a little bigger and smaller, like where you gained weight and lost weight all those years, like rings on a tree trunk, you know what I mean? They like to fill a pew on Sunday mornings, but they're kind of reluctant to do the work of the kingdom, you know, Monday through Saturday. But well, where does the spirit of service begin? Well, it begins at home with mothers and fathers setting the example and praying that their sons and daughters might be involved in the work of the kingdom as teachers and leaders uh, and discipling others that they might be the ones to go out into the world and find the lost to see that the church continues on until Jesus comes again. And believe it or not, your kids and your grandkids are paying attention to everything you do and say. And if they see you acting and saying and believing one thing in church and then, you know, acting and saying and believing something else at home, they will take notice of that. So be sure to be setting the tone with your kids and grandkids and let them follow in your footsteps of service. So Miss Zebedee prayed that her children would be actively involved in the work of his kingdom and we need to walk in her footsteps on that one too. And then here's the third thing I want you to notice about Mrs. Zebedee is she had high hopes. She had high hopes. She aimed high. And when you're working in a kingdom, there are no higher positions than those on the right and the left of the king himself, and that's what she wanted for her sons. Okay, she didn't just pray that her, you know, kids would be, you know, doorkeepers or somewhere out in the big crowd. She wanted them to be on the right and left hand of Jesus. And we might consider Mrs. Zebedee to be brash and presumptuous and, you know, even selfish. But you have to admire her boldness, right? She wanted the best. And it's all too often that people have settled for mediocrity in their Christian life. Yeah, I'm just kind of fair to Midland. And you leave so much on the table when you do. You know, for too long, some have been content with just barely making it through the door. And, you know, for too long, they've been content to just sit back and let things happen. 
Well, it's time for some of us to take our positions on the right hand and the left hand and to mobilize and to make sure the message of Christ goes into all the world. One way or another. Okay, it's time to strive for excellence, to reach for the very best that there is. And the Lord calls us to be his disciples and to be effective laborers in his kingdom. And the Bible says that God made man in his image. I suppose that's why today is special because we recognize that a mother's love is probably the closest example we're ever going to find to God's love. Said unconditional type. Okay, it's a love that goes through the valley of the shadow of death to bring life into being. And from what I've heard, you know, child labor is about the closest thing to going through the valley of the shadow of death that there is. Any mothers agree with that one? Child labor like having the baby, not factories in China. Child labor. You know which one I'm talking about. Right? It's tough. I've had my hand almost broken three times sitting in the hospital. It's a love that sacrifices itself over and over again with even dare to lay down its life for its own uh, offspring. And the story is told uh, out of World War II and the Holocaust that took the lives of millions of people. You know, you all know what happened in the Holocaust. Uh, there's a man named Solomon Rosenberg and, and his family. And this is a true story. Well, Solomon Rosenberg and his wife and their two sons and his mother and father... They were all arrested and placed in a Nazi concentration camp, okay? And it was a labor camp, and the rules were simple. As long as you can do your work, you are permitted to live. But when you become too weak to do your work, then you are exterminated. So Rosenberg watched his mother and father marched off to their deaths, and he knew that next would be his youngest son, David, because... You know, David had always kind of been a frail child. So every evening, Rosenberg, he'd come back into the barracks after his hours of labor, and he'd search for the faces of his family. And when he found them, you know, they would huddle together and hug each other and just thank God for another day of life. Well, one day, Rosenberg came back, and he didn't see those familiar faces. And he finally discovered his oldest son, Joshua, in a corner, huddled and crying and praying. And he said, Josh, tell me it's not true. And Joshua turned and said, it's true, Papa. Today, David was not strong enough to do his work. So they came for him. But where's your mother? Asked Mr. Rosenberg. Well, Papa, he said, when they came for David, he was afraid and he cried. And Mama said, there's nothing to be afraid of, David. And she took his hand and she went with him. Yeah, that's a pretty good picture of motherhood, isn't it? So this is your day, moms. May God bless you in it. Okay, you don't have to do the dishes today. You can do them tomorrow, that's fine. And I pray that if there is someone here who's never experienced the love of God that's so close to the love of a mother, this is going to be your time of decision. And, you know, I pray that if you felt that you've had to walk through that valley alone so many times, you know, that you're going to recognize there's a hand reaching out to you saying there's nothing to be afraid of. I'll go with you. And I pray that you'll recognize that there's one who has already gone through the valley of the shadow of death for you and made it possible for you to live forever. And he extends that loving invitation in much the same way that a mother opens the doors of home and calls her children in. Time to eat, right? Come on in and dine with me. And he calls you too this very day. Now let's close in a word of prayer this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this time uh, we could gather in your house. Once again, I thank you for all of our 
mothers in here, grandmothers, and we just pray that you'd uh, look after them and bless them and keep a hedge of protection around them and just give them the courage that they need to go uh, through day-to-day -day life. And Lord, we just uh, thank you for them, and we thank you for the godly mother examples that you left for us in your word so that uh, we can learn from them and be better parents and grandparents. And we want to lift up the folks on our prayer request list this morning as well and all the praises we have, all the answered prayers we've had out of this little church over the years. And we just thank you for all that you've done. Thank you you came the first time. Thank you that you're coming again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.